Let me introduce Bart, Bart Bender. Hi, bonjour. bonjour. You're the Senior Vice President Sales and Marketing at Interfor. Um, more than 30 years experience in the product woods, uh, the wood products business. You also serve as the chair of the US Woodworks and Canada Wood Group. And uh, before you introduce your company, uh, everyone accepted to share a, a part of their story, your, their personal story. And you said uh, your journey, your personal journey started in Montreal. You were born here. Mm -hmm. Where do you mm. live now? I'm in Vancouver. You're in Vancouver. Yeah. And your father began his career in uh, the wood industry. This is where it all started for you. It did, yeah. Yeah, very early age. Uh, my father worked for Macmillan Bloedel uh, for most of his career. Um, and so, yeah, sawdust has been in the veins uh, ever since. And you started working. Your first job was in a sawmill. Uh, yeah, that, that was a that was a labor job. That was clean up and, and <laughs> green chain. Uh, that's what paid for my university education. And you're here with us today, uh, all this carry out. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you uh, the floor so that you can introduce your company. Okay. Very good. Um. So how do you yeah, with oh, the team, go. we'll put now it I on go the screen. <laughs> 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 okay. There we go. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of slides, give you a bit of an introduction on, on Interfor. Uh, some of it's a duplication to Salo's uh, presentation yesterday. Thanks for that, Salo. Uh, uh, but really, at the end of the day, I just want to give you a, a real cursory introduction. And um, if anyone wants a deeper dive, obviously, we're, we're going to be at the booth in, um, uh, after this. Uh, but also, if you go on the website, there's a really exhaustive investor presentation um, that I'd encourage anyone who, um, who's interested to, uh, to jump into that. It gets into a lot more detail. Uh, first off, I'll give a, a, a brief introduction on the operating regions. So four distinct regions, um, starting off with the BC interior, three dimension mills. Um, we have one reman facility um, in actually Sumas, Washington, so literally just steps over the border. Um, Multi-species region, uh, so Douglas fir, hemp fir, SPF, and cedar, um, which is a bit of a love-hate relationship for those of us who have to manage our way through that. Um, uh, those operations are efficient, modern, um, well-capitalized, and low-cost. So I'll get into that a bit more uh, later on. In the U.S. Northwest, 770 million feet, 16% uh, of our total production. So three stud mills, one of them being a green dug fir mill, and uh, a recent addition in Philomath uh, for a dimension mill. Again, multi-species, hemp fir, dug fir. Um, and those operations are very efficient uh, as well and modern. Uh, U.S. South, 2.2 um, billion feet, essentially, uh, so 47% of our um, operating platform is in the south. Uh, one species, sudden yellow pine, um, and those mills are, are seeing ongoing CapEx investment, and I'll get into that a little bit uh, later on in the slides, uh, what we actually do there. And then, of course, Eastern Canada, which is a, a new region for Interfor. Um, we closed on that acquisition in, in late February. Very happy to be here. Uh, it's a big part of um, our program. So 21% of our operating platform is now in Eastern Canada. We're very excited about those mills, four stud mills, three dimension mills, an iJoyce mill, and a reman. Um, all of them efficient, well-maintained, um, and we look forward to kind of interforizing those from a capital perspective um, as, we, uh, as we move on. Next slide, just to give you a little picture of our growth trajectory. Uh, Interfor started off in 1963 with a, a coastal BC uh, sawmill operation, Yorkton uh, Forest Products. Um, from there, largely centered on coastal uh, business, so a lot of tenure on the coast and operations on the coast. So looking at 2001, we were 83% coastal operations. We had one operation. Um, in, uh, in Adams Lake, which is just outside of Kamloops, which is a dimension mill. Uh, from then, we realized that the best thing for us, for growth, um, is to divest away from the coast uh, and expand into other regions. And so you can see the progression of that. 2012, um, 
largely BC coast, BC interior, um, and, uh, uh, and the US Northwest. Uh, in, 20, in 2013, that was our first acquisition in the south. Uh, since then, we're now at 2.2 billion feet, and uh, we've got 13 sawmills there. So uh, that's been a very nice addition for us. Uh, so 2021, um, you can see the, uh, how, that, how that divides up. Um, still have some operations on the coast. 2022, uh, we've added, added Eastern Canada. Um, we've totally divested from all manufacturing facilities on the coast. So our last mill was Acorn Forest Products and it, uh, um, it, it was sold, actually closed two weeks ago. So that's taken us completely out of the coast from a manufacturing standpoint. And, uh, and that's what it looks like today for us. So last slide um, gives you a little idea about our strategy. Um, so it's been consistent. It's uh, something that we've been doing since the early 2000s and that's really, we acquire and invest. Um, so we did that in the US Northwest. We've done that in the BC interior where we bought um, older mills and we fixed them up uh, and made them very competitive. Uh, fast forward U US South, the same approach. Um, we've got 13 mills. Many of them are under sort of different phases of capital, um, but they're ultimately all on a pathway to be top quartile mills. Eastern Canada, that's the latest for us. Um, you know, that closed just recently, so we're just getting an idea of what we're dealing with there. Uh, we'll start off and focus on operational integration, bringing them into, into, uh, into our world, and we'll also leverage the world that they are in, um, go through best practices, figure out what's working best, um, and, and applying those both not only at uh, the Eastern Canadian operations, but taking the great ideas that they have and applying them to our operations in the other regions. Anyways, and then after that, we'll get into capital investment, which is what we do um, and how we uh, fix up all our assets to be top quartile. So that takes me through the introduction. I'll pass it over. Awesome. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Steve Rohn, bonjour. Good morning. <laughs> Steve is the President and Chief Executive Officer at Western Forest. Um, in your bio, I like this phrase. You have been a vital part of Western Forest for over 30 years. You've, uh, you've uh, been in management position, probably most of them, uh, through the years. Um, and you say that you started at the company, in, with the company at 17 years old. Um, how do you say that? Piling lumber? Yes. Can you tell us a, a bit about it, the first years? <laughs> <laughs> General labor role, piling wood off the back of one of our production saws and, uh, and learning a little bit about what the wood business was about as a young kid. And you say the company is a, a place for offering opportunities to people. So you took this opportunity when you were 17 and then you grew up in the company as being the leader today. It's awesome. Thank you for being with us. Do you like it being in May this year instead of during winter when we have the snowstorms, <laughs> you miss Valentine's Day, things like that? Uh, I've, uh, I've spent many cold Februaries in Montreal uh, <laughs> with uh, this convention, but it's been a great experience being part of uh, the lumber business in this city year after year. So I cannot tell, because I'm not the decision maker, I cannot tell it's going to be in May each year, but enjoy this edition. <laughs> I'll let you introduce so Western Forest, please. Thank you very much. So Western Forest today is a, is a group of um, four organizations that we own and a number of third-party logistics facilities that we use throughout the country. The facilities that we own are the core business, Western Forest Products, Bramwood Forest, located in southern Ontario as well, Montera Lumber Mills, which is a remanufacturing facility making strips and other value-added products, and Northern Industrial Wood Products in Lincoln, Michigan. Um, rural Michigan, also doing industrial wood products. I promised uh, Sven I would keep this very, very short. So Sven, I will, I will whip through it. Um, our our, cult, our uh, corporate uh, goals are built around three pillars. We focus on culture, which is about our people and making sure that our people are first creating opportunities 
the customer experience, having a little bit of fun together while we work, and to be a little bit charitable and make sure that we're giving back to the communities that we're operating in. Commitment is about safety, first accountability to each other, work ethic, attendance, and a mindset of continuous improvement. How do we get better all the time? And then we build around growth. We want to make sure we're growing personally, professionally, through sales, through products, and through geography. Our strategic summary, and I'm not going to go through it all, but clearly I want to start with our vision and end with our values. Our vision is to be the partner, the right partner for our employees, our customers, and our suppliers. It's important to us that all of the stakeholders in our business are represented in what we do. And we'll drop down to the core values, but everything that we do has to go through these lenses. Um, that we're an entrepreneurial organization committed to continuous improvement. We do what we say, inspiring personal and professional growth for all of our people. Your success is our success. It's more than just a place to work. It wants to be a place where people truly enjoy coming, coming and spending time together. And results matter, but the people matter more. So what we do, we have a number of different segments that we focus on in, in different parts of the wood product space. Uh, we try and do things that are a little bit specialized or a little bit niche or put them into separate boxes. They all kind of play off of each other and relate together. Uh, our industrial lumber distribution business, what we call construction, which focuses primarily on infrastructure. Pallet and box, which are the people assembling and creating wood packaging. The truss lumber business, people asse assembling roof and wall component systems and that sort of thing. Our U.S. Commodity Trading Division would focus on distribution to retail and, uh, and pro dealer yards. Wholesale, which is simply taking advantage of the volumes that we have available and opportunistically selling them. Um, we focus on wholesale with softwood and hardwood. Retail dealers, which is selling to the uh, Canadian distribution yards. Mill sales, we represent some small sawmills in northern Ontario primarily, a little bit uh, in Quebec as well, where we sell a large percentage or all of their production for them and various panel products. We also have a few specialty products that we represent. We're a distributor for Acre, which is a, a product manufactured by Modern Mill. Thermalwood Canada, we distribute for them in Ontario. And Teva Building Products, we distribute across Canada. It's a high-end PVC decking line. That's what I've got for you. Thank you. <laughs> Hugues Simon, bonjour. Bonjour. Hugues is the president of wood, of wood Products in Quebec, Ontario, Arkansas, and Florida for Resolute Forest Products based here in Montreal. When we met last time, you were um, the president of uh, Barrett Wood. Uh, so welcome back. I mean, you, you, you're all uh, familiar with the event. And I don't know what happened to, to each of you when you were 17, but there's something else happening <laughs> in his uh, life at 17. Um, Hugues, you say that you grew up on a farm, but your dad said you should go to school. And then you traveled, you decided to learn English, and at some point you fell in love with the forest, with the tropical forest at first. Can you tell us more about it? Well, my, my parents didn't want uh, all three kids to take over the farm because it was too much work. So they <laughs> sent my sister to Japan to learn Japanese, my brother to Alaska, and I ended up in Jamaica. Uh, so that's why I fell in love with the forest. It was tropical, but now it's not tropical anymore. <laughs> but you fell in love with the forest and you decided to study in that field and, and um, How do we say that? Faire, faire ta carrière dans ce, dans ce domaine. Bravo, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. I'll let you introduce uh, Resolute, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, basically, a lot of you know, know about Resolute. Uh, Resolute is a bit of a different path than what you've seen with uh, my colleagues here. Uh, come from a new sprint environment. And as you know, if uh, any of you still buy newspaper? <laughs> So you see, that's why we got away from newspaper and uh, focus on a, a different product. Uh, Resolute today is all about pulp and uh, lumber. So basically, the decision was made a few years back to uh, we're going to keep the best assets for, for paper because there's still people using paper, not in this room, 
But if you go elsewhere in the world, and there's not only newsprint, right? There's other paper like uh, for annual reports, uh, catalogs, and, and you'll find that uh, people want to shop on the internet, but sometimes there's type of paper that people like to receive. So paper, paper is not going away, but it's not growing anymore. So we're keeping our best assets and to maintain them as, as good as we can and to ship wherever the market uh, is available. Right now, North America is falling, uh, but some of the rest of the world is still seeing some uh, very small growth in, uh, in some type of paper. Uh, also made the decision to grow in pulp. We've invested in our mill in Saint-Félicien, Quebec. Uh, pulp is not being used to make a lot of paper. It's being used to make tissue, uh, socks, clothes. There's a bunch of things that are made, masks. I think everybody wore a mask here in the last two years, <laughs> more than reading the paper. Uh, so focusing really on products that uh, have a future and have a growth potential over the, the coming years. Uh, we've made acquisition in the US, uh, in Arkansas, two mills in Arkansas and uh, one in Florida. Did not buy first quartile sawmills, so we have a lot of investments to make in those mills. Uh, Obviously, you, you probably all know that the market on buying sawmills uh, has evolved quite a bit over the last five years. Uh, so you either buy a first quartile and pay a price, or you buy a second, third, or fourth quartile and look at the potential and fix them up. So that's the uh, slow approach that we're doing in the US. So three sawmills will be producing over half a billion board feet by the end of next year in, uh, in the US. So that's going to be about 20% uh, of, uh, of our production. So you see the transformation from 2016 to 2021. Of course, uh, lumber price has something to do with that, uh, but also a lot of volume switching from paper to other products. 57%, so basically down uh, half on the, on the exposure to paper. So when uh, people that know Resolute, because Resolute's been uh, probably the combination of uh, 25 different companies. Uh, back in the days when I started in the industry in 1991, uh, the company was producing the equivalent when you merge a company of 15,000 tons of newsprint a day. So, so t today it's not even a thousand. So you see how the transformation went on. So we're very much integrated. Uh, all the sawmill residuals that we have, uh, we're over 85% when we combine uh, all the, the three regions that you operate. So we use up everything that we bring from the forest. Thank you. Thank you. Merci pour être avec nous. Thank, Thank you. And last but not the least, because he's a panelist, he's also the moderator of our discussion, Paul Janke. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, you're a principal of Forest Economic Advisor with the main area of expertise in North America lumber markets. Uh, I want to mention that prior to uh, having this interest and this um, expertise in the lumber market, you were uh, acting as a research economist at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in Stockholm, Stockholm yes. Sweden. Um, so glad you you decided to work in our industry so that yes. you're with us. Oh, oh, oh. At this very moment, he's uh, the industry's top economic analyst. So we're glad uh, that you can moderate the discussion. But tell me something. What Do you uh, have a, a hockey story with uh, Montreal? <laughs> can, can we talk about it? Yes, we can? Well, yes, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm from Boston, so I'm um, obviously a Boston Bruins fan, and I think it's pretty well known that normally when I uh, do these presentations, I'm wearing my Bruins jersey, but this year was uh, obviously not a great year for us, so I decided to leave that at home. <laughs> you don't see Montreal jerseys either. No, no. <laughs> the, I did have a, um, so actually we were, we were visiting um, back in the day when it was Abitibi, we were visiting you guys, and, um, and I was wearing my Bruins hat, and I was down in having lunch in the cafeteria, and a, a, this just very, very large trucker walked in, and he stole my hat, and he stopped, and he just was staring at me, and my, my partner, Brendan, was just got this big smile on his face because he thought I was going to get beat up, <laughs> but <laughs> luckily it didn't happen. You remember visiting MBTB. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, you might have a short introduction, and sure. then I'll, I'll let you go with the discussion, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, normally, I have mostly pictures. I'm not really good at uh, reading. I'd like to keep that at the third grade level, but um, I have lots of, lots of uh, text slides, and Sven said, please don't read them. So I'm actually not going to read these, and I'm, not, and I'm actually not even going to use them. So uh, I think you guys will 
get a sense of what it is that FEA does based on the slides that I'm gonna show next. But um, we are a company of 22 people. We started, great timing, we started in August of 2009, right when the markets really hit their bottom. So um, this is the person that you're gonna take advice from today. So uh, um, we started with five people and we've grown our business to 22. And just to give you a sense of where we put our priorities, of those 22 people, um, 19 of them are our analysts. So we really focus heavily on trying to provide the best analysis and really understanding these markets. We, and we initially focused on North America, but obviously as, these, as our markets became more global, up until uh, last year, um, as these markets became more global, we started expanding overseas, and so we now have offices in um, New Zealand, Australia, um, Europe, South America, and China, so that we so that we can really have a good understanding of what's happening in all these different markets. So that would be it. I'll, oh wow! I'll, I'll skip all the rest <laughs> of the text. It deserves <laughs> a round of applause. Hi, <laughs> nice, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Did good with the challenge. So um, it's it's your turn. I hand it over all to right, you. Thanks. All right. I'm gonna. When we're doing questions, I'll sit, but I'll just, I'll stand for the first um, set of presentations. So, um, well, before I get into there, th this session, as you guys know, as Karina had already mentioned, we're gonna talk about the supply and demand dynamics that have led to such volatile markets and such high pricing um, and difficulty to get lumber over the past two years. And then we'll wrap it up with something that's really new and has really started to affect the industry more over the past six months or so, and that's the changing geopolitical landscape and how that could potentially affect trade patterns. So the way we're gonna organize this is that I'm going to just lay out, this is where FEA see things, sees things going over the next couple of years, this year and next year, um, to sort of provide a base for which to start asking questions. And then these guys are obviously the real experts, um, so I'll, I'll turn it over, we'll, we'll, we'll ask them questions. If my, uh, I am actually very happy to be part of this distinguished panel. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I, if, my kids, if my kids were here, they'd look at this stage and say, one of these things is not like the other. But, uh, <laughs> there's way too much hair up here. Um, <clears throat> way too much lettuce. <laughs> Anyhow, so I, I think none of the things that I'm gonna talk about now are new to you guys. These are, this is a, a pattern that's been taking place over the course of really 15 years or so. Um, and that is the changing supply of uh, timber that's available. So Oog said that you, know, you, could, you have the choice of investing in um, a, a top quartile mill or a low, lower quartile mill, but the one thing you wanna make sure of whatever mill you're gonna invest in, you need to make sure there's gonna be fiber there. You need to make sure there's timber or it doesn't matter how good of a mill it is, you're not gonna, um, you're not gonna be able to produce any lumber. So at the end of the day, you can, you can overcome issues with machinery, you can overcome issues with labor, but it takes, it takes decades to overcome fiber issues. Um, so what's the fiber situation? If we look across North America, what these graphs here show is it shows the um, inventory, which is the line, so that's the amount of timber that's actually out there in the forest, um, available for harvesting and for turning into lumber. And then the, um, the, the line that's not quite so volatile is the growth rate of that inventory, the, the amount of growth we see, and then the more volatile area, I'm sorry, not line, but area, the, the more volatile area is the drain, that's the harvest level. So you can see that when drain um, is below growth, we see inventories increasing, and when drain is above growth, we see inventories decreasing. And if you're a timberland owner and your inventories are decreasing, that just means there's not a lot of supply available to expand capacity. So if we look at the US West, we see we are um, either in a situation where drain exceeds growth in the West Coast, or we're gonna rapidly approach a situation where that's the case in the US West Inland. Um, and just to, I don't know if, I, if you guys have heard this, but this news just came out today, but in Oregon, they, um, they just signed a bill changing the, um, the forest practices, and so we're looking, our analysis of this says that we're gonna lose somewhere, be, we expect about 250 million board feet of timber that's gonna come off because of these new, because of the new regulations, and that translates into about um, 500, billion, 500 million board feet of lumber lost. So um, it could go as far as 500 million board feet of timber, which translates into about a, a billion board feet of lumber. So 
I, I think that it's safe to say that in the West, there's not a lot of room for capacity expansion. And if anything, over the next couple of years, we might see capacity start to shrink a little bit. So obviously that timber is available for all markets. So we could see shifts, we could see lower log exports, we could see shifts from plywood to lumber. Um, we could, so there's, there's, there's a possibility that we're not gonna lose as much lumber, but still, there's, um, it's a region that I, I'm not sure if a lot of people are familiar with, but we, we probably are gonna see um, limited ability to expand capacity there. I won't spend a lot of time talking about the BC interior because we know that story, but um, you know, we, we've seen annual allowable cuts go down. Um, we're in the process of seeing another round of, um, of reductions, and we'll get, as we institute the new, um, as BC institutes the new um, supply issues with, in terms of First Nations and in terms of old growth, so that's happening currently, and then as we get out into the middle part of this decade, there's another round of reductions that have to do with the, 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 um, the end of the mountain pine beetle, spruce beetle, um, also the fires that occurred in 17 and 18, um, and setting aside land for the mountain caribou or the woodlands caribou. So for all these regions, reasons, we see not a lot of room for capacity expansion, and in fact, capacity declines in British Columbia. And then that leaves the other Eastern Canadian provinces. And at first look, when you look at this, it looks like there's actually a lot of, um, or potential for some supply available in Quebec and Ontario, not so much room in some of the other provinces. Um, but a lot of that wood is, is further north and it's smaller, and so it's just more expensive if you do want to turn it into lumber. And then, so that really leaves the only region with any excess timber supply being in the US South. Um, and this is that same graph I showed for the West, where you can see inventory, growth, and drain. And you can see it's really not until the middle of the, this decade, so 25 or so, where we start to see drain exceeding growth. So for now, there's still room for capacity expansion in the South. And then I just wanted to wrap this up by pointing out something that was interesting, and I'll, I'll tie this in with the questions, and that is that we had the two best lumber markets that we've ever seen in the past two years in terms of pricing, so the two highest priced lumber markets. And so, um, you would think in that environment that we would actually see production and expanding, but actually, if you look at it across all the different regions, we really didn't see much of an increase in production. So why was that? Um, you know, we have our own reasons. Uh, we have our own understanding of why this is. Um, I think that these guys would agree that part of it is logistics. The, you, you can't ship the wood. You can't, uh, you can't produce anymore. So a portion of that's logistics. Um, a portion of it had to do with labor. You have your, your labor force, um, you had COVID come in, you had all of everything associated with COVID, you had the retirement of a number of people who tended to be older, so they were the more skilled workers, and then the difficulty of getting labor to come in. And then you had weather events across North America. So you had the rain in British Columbia, you had the extremely cold weather across the US South, and then you had extremely wet weather in the US South as well. So for all these reasons, we didn't see, um, you know, we, did, we really didn't see production increase um, as much as one would expect given those high prices. So with that, I'm done talking. That kind of lays it out um, that where we see these uh, where where we see these markets going over the next two years. And now I'll just kind of open it up to questions. And Bart, I'll, I'll probably start off with you um, okay. since you're first down there. Um, the the question I would most like to ask you, since Interfor started off in British Columbia, is um, what do you see happening over the next five years in terms of the ability of British Columbia to supply lumber? Um, and then. I can either ask a full question at once or I can do a follow-up when you're done. Okay. But I'll, I'll wait to see your answer. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously the, uh, um, the available uh, cut is under pressure. Um, and uh, we've gone through that phase of getting through all the lodge, the lodgepole pine that was affected by the, uh, uh, the beetle. Um, and so that's predominantly um, dealt with now, and so it's about bringing that sort of uh, allowable cut to the levels of uh, sustainability that are required in that area. And um, the unfortunate part about that is that that means we have too many sawmills for not enough trees, uh, and it's pretty simple, really, when you when you think about it. And so, um, so the process has been going on for some time. There's been obviously a lot of mills that uh, that have been permanently um, shut down over the o over like maybe the past sort of three to five years. Um, and the forecast, I think Daryl talked about it yesterday, um, the forecast is for another one to two billion feet that needs to come out of the market. And my personal opinion, it's sort of at the upper end of that range um, that's still to come. Um, how that will come, it's a little bit of a question mark because uh, um, you know these markets make it possible for mills to, to run less efficiently. 
Um, and so I think personally that it's going to take a, a difficult market um, uh, before we see sort of you know the real extent to which uh, production is going to be taken out of the, out of BC. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then a follow up since you guys are really active in the uh, in the U.S. South. Obviously, there's been a lot of investment, not just you guys, but from a number of different com companies and. I, so we see all this new capacity that's coming online, yet you, you look at that last chart that I threw up there and, and um, production didn't really increase. Is there, um, are there reasons why that's the case? Is that, does that have the potential to, to are, there, are the reasons for that, does that have the potential to slow uh, additional capacity expansions or do you see the capacity expansions in the South continuing at the pace that we've seen over the past couple of years? Um, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, r really, the fact that the South maintained their production year over year is uh, is a testament, quite yeah. frankly. Uh, you know, given the adversity that we faced in that region, um, I mean, every quarter had some sort of a um, you know a weather event. Uh, we had Hurricane Ida in there as well, and um, there were times when we couldn't get logs to the mills, um, and mills weren't just simply weren't running. It was just too wet to log. Um, so they were certainly dealing through through that part of it, but the other the other piece that sometimes gets forgotten um, is the extent to which COVID impacted the abilities for the mills to run. I mean, there was a um, a stage, I suppose, late fourth quarter and and actually into first quarter where where the COVID activity in the south was was quite extreme, and it was hard to get employees. Um, you know, get enough employees to run these mills. And so we saw uh, a fair bit of production slow down just, just because of that. But really, to me, it's, it's, it's weather and, and labor. And, yeah. um, uh, going forward, um, there's a lot of investment going in in that region. Um, there's a lot of available timber. You saw the, um, the slide. Uh, it's a great place to, to invest for that reason. Uh, the trees are there. Um, and so I would expect that region to... to grow yeah. um, over time. Yeah. And to, so I'm a, I'm a nerd, so I like to look at data. <laughs> and um, just to put some data behind what you said with the weather events, if we look at 2021 as a, in the weather anomaly, because we, uh, we can track all sorts of things, moisture in the ground. Um, but one of the things we look at is, um, is just the rainfall. And there was more than 20 inches above average rainfall last year in the south. So t more than 20 inches above. So in an already particularly wet region, especially in certain months of the year, you had a tremendous amount of water and moisture in the ground. So we heard not just from you, but we heard from a number of people that that was the yeah. case. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very difficult to log in those conditions. Yeah. There's no <laughs> question. So, Oog, um, I'm going to follow up. We, we talked a little bit about the south and, and um, and in, uh, in British Columbia, how do you see in Eastern Canada, because of your presence in Eastern Canada, do you see there being, I mean, I, I look at this chart and I say, oh, there's a lot of room for, I mean, this, maybe we're wrong with the data, but uh, this, is, this looks like there's room in terms of a annual allowable cut to increase production in, in Quebec and Ontario. Is that something that's possible or is that, uh, is that gonna be difficult to do? Well, it's possible. I mean, the government of Quebec announced that they, they wanted to double the avail availability of uh, logs by 2050. Now, 2050 is a long time from now, <laughs> right? And that's usually what governments do is like they, they give you something that's so far away. But, but what's important is when you look at the quality of the forest in Quebec, it's, we have good, good trees, good availability. What needs to happen, and uh, it's true for Quebec, and uh, I believe it's true for the whole industry, is we need to sell the sustainable story better. Uh, a lot of the headwinds that we have as an industry is really accessing the forest. Uh, we have a good story to tell because we're, we're building with something that's sustainable. We're very bad at selling that story. The day that we find a solution to, to tell the world the good about harvesting trees, replanting trees, and the whole like, uh, cycle uh, will make it easy, easy, much easier for us to access the forest. Yeah. Uh, and you see, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, NGOs, and, and people always have a good, uh, there's good reasons why, why people want uh, the industry to, uh, to slow down. But there's a problem with the understanding of what we're doing. We need to do a better job at that. Uh, when you look at the chart, I mean, uh, and Bart said it well, I mean, people tend to forget in the last two years uh, the impact of COVID. And I mean, uh, most of us here, we work in offices, but I can tell you that people working in sawmills wearing a mask 
it's warm, uh, wearing a face mask, having to, to do all these restrictions. Uh, just for the industry to maintain the rate that we've seen here, to me, I mean, uh, it's, it's a big achievement. doesn't matter what region. Uh, Bart was talking about the South. Uh, I'll talk for Resolute. The vaccination rate in the South was like below 30%. Uh, so, of course, we, we had different issues. Uh, and then in the north, we have so many restrictions. Uh, uh, running operations in Quebec, you see that uh, we like restrictions in Quebec. Like We, uh, we had to go home by 8 o'clock. I mean, uh, we were the last one to remove the mask. Uh, so it's a different way of, uh, of, 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 doing, of doing business, but it did have a major impact uh, on the ability to produce. Because in, the, in sawmills, in the, all of you guys, that girls that run sawmills, it's not like, I mean, some industries, if you're short three or four people, it's no big deal. But if, if the, the guy that runs or the girl that runs the saw line is not there, I mean, it's a different challenge. Quebec, uh, you go back in history, Quebec is one village, one sawmill. So we're known for having small sawmills. Uh, the consolidation has started, and I believe the consolidation, either with acquisitions or within the same company, is going to continue. Because to be competitive in the East, you, you, we'll, we'll need to go the size of our sawmills. Yeah. A follow-up question, and then Steve, I'll get, I'll get to you in, in a second, But because um, I'm going to shift tax a little bit. But um, a follow-up question, and this, I, it could be for either, either Ugo or for, um, for Bart, but if, as we see the shift of production away from SPF and towards Southern Pine, the, the species have different characteristics. Um, so traditionally, SPF has been used for framing, and Southern Pine has been more heavily used in, um, in uh, treated applications, outdoor applications. Although, to be fair, in the South, it's still this, Southern Pine is heavily used for framing, so you can actually use it. It's just not the preferred species. Are you guys finding acceptance? Um, and I'll, I'll start with you again. If, if you want to add anything, Bart, feel free. But, um, and Steve, you can feel free to jump in too. Are you finding acceptance of, of Southern Pine as a substitute for uh, SPF? Well, definitely when uh, there's a price gap, customers uh, look at alternatives. Yeah. I don't think it's only uh, Southern Pine versus SPF. It's mm. also like uh, uh, steel, it's, it's, it's other products. What we've seen uh, in, in, in the pricing movement over the last three years, I mean, the market will find its place. But extremes like that, they're, they're, they're never good. Uh, people, like, like there's, there's some regions in the US, they're right in the middle. So from a logistics standpoint, it's easy to make the switch. But uh, you go to the big box, uh, you see SYP in the north right now. Right. Uh, and and, and it's, all about, it's all about price. Uh, the ability for the north to supply SPF is, is under so much pressure that, I mean, the market will find its balance. Uh, but at the end of the day, the customer will decide uh, there's a question of price, but there's also a question of efficiency of installation. So that old mix will make, uh, right. will make the right decision. So it's a combination of price and installed cost. You guys, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would, it comes down to three things for me. It's preference, uh, it's availability, and it's price. Um, and those three pillars will kind of pull at each other. And, and uh, as Hoog said, the, the market will decide. Yeah. Yeah. I think the fact that pine is typically the cheapest of the species options dictates what the preference is in the market. And right. ultimately, at a point, it still gets used because of the economics of it. Yeah. And it's amazing because as we go forward, pine's going to definitely be the cheapest. I know we were forecasting probably five or six years ago that we were going to see southern pine actually move in line with SPF prices. And, and at the time, people were like, oh, is that, that's not going to happen. As an FOB mill price basis, and say, that's not going to happen. But uh, it's turned out that it's now selling at a discount. So mm -hmm. um, it's pretty amazing. Um, I just wanted to, so I guess one point, in terms of steel, so we do compete with steel, but the good news in our industry um, for the environment, because obviously you much would prefer to build out of wood than building out of steel, because wood sequesters carbon and holds it for as long as the building is standing, whereas steel emits tons and tons of carbon and doesn't um, sequester any of it. So the good news for the environment and for our industry um, is that steel, ha even, even though lumber prices have been very volatile, steel prices, so we track all these things, and steel prices have been just as volatile. So that's good news. So, and we haven't seen a big switch over towards steel. Um, we have seen a bit of a shift towards masonry, so concrete, uh, but that's because the homes that we're building more homes in the south, which are more heavily weighted towards co using concrete. So it's not a, we haven't seen the preference shift yet, which is uh, good news. 
So supply is made up not just of the ability of mills to produce, but historically, especially if you're talking about short-term market trends, um, supplies also inventories at the dealer level. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed in tracking the data over the past um, you know, 20 years is that inventories have gone down um, over time as, as buyers go more and more towards just-in-time buying. Um, but when we hit the pandemic, inventories got extremely low relative to, well, both low in absolute terms and relative to consumption at the dealer level. Um, so a question, I have a twofold question for you, Steve. One is across, um, you know, across the markets that you work in, are you noticing um, that our inventory is still extremely low? Are they starting to come back a little bit? Um, number one, and number two, are you noticing, or do you have any sense if people are gonna go more towards a, a just-in-case buying strategy as opposed to a just-in-time buying strategy? So are we gonna see inventories building over the next uh, couple of years relative to um, the trends that we've seen over the last two decades? So yes, I think uh, the inventory dynamics have changed dramatically for many buyers uh, in the marketplace. At the moment, I, would, uh, I still feel that inventory levels are quite low. Um, but they're low at different points in, in different geographies uh, and in different product mixes. I think part of the issue has, has been that customers have become afraid uh, and they're not willing to take the chances that they used to take. The volatility obviously hurt a lot of people uh, uh, pretty badly. The upside was easy when everything was getting more expensive every week, but, uh, but when we went over the, the tipping point, last spring, uh, the correction was pretty harsh and, and that was painful for some. Um, I think the other part is the, the, the supply chain is a little disjointed still and so the pockets where, because of logistical challenge, the pockets where there is a gap in, in your expectations for shipments and deliveries isn't always in the same place and, and isn't always predictable. And so there was a pattern of buying just in case, and every time we're having the big push up in the market as a general trend, the, the feeling is that the customers want to buy just in case as well as just in time. Right. And, and so it exponentially increases the volatility on the upside and then leaves bigger room for the free fall on the downside. And I think that pattern's gonna continue, but it's, it's starting to get smaller. The bounces up are a little smaller, the, the drop might be a little bit smaller. We're going to start to find an equilibrium where we resume normal trading, whatever right. that is. Right. Right. Um, well, thank you. Um, do you guys want? Do you guys want to add anything? Otherwise, this is actually a really good segue to move into the into the demand side. If there's nothing else, um, I'm thinking I'm getting the hook. Right. We got to move on. All right. <laughs> I, I'm just going to oh, add a, yes. a wild card. Uh, yeah. Uh, the railroads. Uh, mm. the, the, the railroad is yeah. a wild card because yeah. uh, it is a oligopoly in Canada, right? And probably the same in the US. And uh, we need to fix the ability to, to adapt to a market because uh, if anything, uh, and you, your graph are, are telling it well, the industry has been pretty steady at producing. So the whole network and whether it's rail and, and we can talk about uh, the trucking as well, uh, I think the business model there is going to evolve, it's going to change. Yeah. If you go back like 20 years, uh, some of the eastern producers were doing barge into Florida. I think we're going to see barge again. So, so the, the pockets of inventories, mm -hmm. they're going to change. It's going to take time because the, I mean, the railroads are struggling, the trucking is struggling, and uh, the vessels are struggling as well. So, but, but they're not going to solve themselves at the same time. Yeah. So there will be a, a, a window for, for the whole network to, to evolve. And I believe that once that evolves, if, if the right customers have the same vision, uh, this can be a new way of, uh, of, of moving uh, lumber around North America. I think that's an excellent point, um, especially if you think that historically, this evolution um, is going to take place um, because historically, you know, your major producing regions were the west of North America, and it's going to increasingly become the east and the south. And the west has always used rail to ship their wood, whereas the south has been, and, and um, eastern Canada has been more heavily weighted towards the trucks. So we're going we're gonna to see that shift. And, and if you're a rail carrier, why are you going to invest in new rail cars? Why are you going to invest in new center beams if you know that in two to three years from now you're going to see a decline in production from a particular region. 
Um, so I think that that's a really good point and that one of the supply side constraints that we're gonna see, and, and I, I, I'm not gonna take credit for this because I heard this this morning from, um, from one of you guys actually, I don't see if he's in here, but uh, he said that he thinks that production is gonna be limited by logistics and I think it's a really good point. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there's a real possibility that that's the case. Um, all right, so talking about inventory, it is a good segue into the next section, which is demand. So if we're thinking about inventories and is it possible for inventories to sort of balance out um, it, act, absolute levels of inventories aren't as important as um, relative levels of inventory. And what do I mean by that? I mean inventory relative to consumption. So if you have consumption growing and consumption really strong, you need more inventories. But if your consumption is weak or weakening, then you don't, just simply don't need as much inventory. So one of the things that might potentially help to balance out the inventory issues is we could see some, some weaker consumption. So um, with that, we're gonna get into the demand side. Um, and one of the questions that I get, is, so I'm an economist, um, you know, all my training has been in economics, um, although I've been in the industry for nearly 30 years, but uh, still I'm an economist at heart. And um, so the first question I always get is, well, aside from where should I invest in the stock market, which I have no <laughs> idea. Um, I'm, my strategy has always been buy high, sell low, which hasn't worked out too well for me. But, um, but yes, are we gonna have a recession? That's the question everyone always asks. So just to get the answer out there right from the very beginning, we, FEA currently doesn't see a recession coming. Um, we do see a slowdown occurring next year. So, and we are very concerned about that slowdown actually becoming a recession. If it does become a recession, then we do think it's gonna be mild because consumer balance sheets are very, very strong. Uh, business balance sheets are strong. There's a huge backlog in demand for products. Um, and we're seeing a major reshoring of industry coming back into North America because of political winds that had started flowing back in 2016 and continued through current, the current administration and also the effects of COVID. So you have COVID, you realize that these long extended supply chains perhaps aren't the best thing to have and that you may want to start to shorten those supply chains a little bit. Um, so we see more uh, industrial activity occurring in, um, you know, in North America. So, so for all those reasons, we think that if we do have a recession, it's going to be mild. But why, why is this the question that everybody's asking us? Why, do, why are people concerned about a recession? Um, it's really this chart right here. So the federal funds rate um, has gone up 50 basis points already. Um, and actually, it's gone up more than that. But um, we see a total of five 50 basis point increases um, over the next year and a half or so. So the Fed's going to raise short-term interest rates dramatically. Well, what does that mean for the economy? Well, banks borrow money short which is the federal funds rate, short rates, they lend money long. So if the, if the short-term rates are moving up and the long-term rates don't move up as quickly, you start to get a squeeze at the banks, so banks become more cautious in how they lend. And if that inverts, what's considered an inverted yield curve, if the short rates go higher than the long rates, then banks actually lose money every time they lend money. So the banks are gonna stop lending altogether. So we can go back historically since World War II, and actually we have data back to the early 1900s, every time the yield curve inverts, we do have a recession. It can take anywhere from eight months to 36 months, so it could take a long time. Um, the yield curve has not yet inverted, which is part of the reason why we don't think there's gonna be a recession, but it's coming very close. But in any case, for our industry, which is, that does tend to be, uh, for the end use markets for our products, um, which do tend to be highly interest rate sensitive, we are seeing interest rates moving up, and that means mortgage rates have gone up significantly as well. So this is obviously a big concern, which should cause a bit of a slowdown. So what does that mean in terms of our forecast? Well, we do see markets starting to slow down some next year. Um, this is housing starts, is on your guys' uh, right? I don't know, yeah, it's on your left. So it's on the left, oh, it's the same. Um, it's on your left. And um, residential improvements, those are your two biggest markets, 70 to 75% of consumption is, is done in these two markets. So um, we see both of those markets slowing down. But if you look at these graphs, we're not looking for a major recession, we're just looking for a bit of a slowdown. So if we're looking at housing starts in 23 over 22, we're thinking 1.67 housing starts in 22, 1.64 on average in 23. Um, so it's not a big decline there. Same thing with R&R expenditures, a bit sharper of a drop uh, in part, it's because this data was just revised up by $10 billion. It's incredibly volatile and it's subject to huge revisions. So we only have one month, so it's only one month. The, we can, we've seen up to 30% revisions in this data, so we're not yet comfortable saying that the, this last point, that this point right here is actual. It could very well get revised down. So in any case, um, if you look at this relative to where we've been over the past couple of years, we're looking for R&R expenditures to be a little bit lower but not a, huge, not a huge decline. 
So why do we think, the, so the, the reason for the downturn, obviously the rising interest rates or the slowdown in the rising interest rates, why don't we think it's gonna be sharp? And why do we think housing starts are actually gonna remain pretty strong this year? I mean, we, we had 172 was April's report and we're saying 167 for the year. So we're saying housing starts are hardly gonna fall at all. So part of the reason is builders have permitted a bunch of homes that they haven't yet started. So these homes have all been permitted. Home prices are up 20%. They've been up you know, 10 to 20% for the past couple of years. So home builders are making a lot of money. And they're still, I know, despite the fact that the um, new home sales data came out yesterday that was um, quite low, they still are selling everything that they can build. And their homes are selling for more than their asking price. So builders are going to continue to build homes. Um, so that's sort of the short term. And then longer run, why don't we see more of a downturn? Well, at the end of the day, the demographic tailwinds are just way too strong to see a, a steep decline. And I think the easiest way to put this is over the past 15 years, we averaged, our housing starts over the past 15 years average below any recession, aside from the Great Recession, but below any recession since World War II. So our average housing starts for this industry, we were in a 15 year recession in this industry practically. So we had one, well, under 1 .2, we built under 1.2 million new homes per year in the US, and yet our population grew by three million adults per year. So these people aren't getting housed. So there's a tremendous amount of pent up demand. And that's that underlying demand that we, oh, wrong button. That's that underlying demand that I'm showing here. So strong pent up, or underbuilding, sorry. Strong, strong um, pent up demand. And then the other point, and this really plays out for this entire decade, is our largest population age groups are in their late 20s and early 30s right now. Those are your prime home buying years. So we're gonna see strong, um, we're gonna see strong demographic tailwinds to push demand up. So if we have a recession, our industries are not, the industries where we use, um, where that use lumber are not gonna see, are not gonna bear the brunt of that recession. Whereas we did over the course of the last recession. By the way, if I had, and, and I don't have it up here, but if I had this little um, drop in population during the last recession, they were in their late, 20s and early 30s. So when people say, why was the recession so bad? It wasn't just because of the, um, the mortgage crisis. That, that was the catalyst that started it all. But the other piece was we had a dearth of people in their late 20s and early 30s. All right, I'm going to get the hook here because you guys need to talk. Um, so r, &R <laughs> I warned them that I could talk the whole time. Um, r, r activity is going to stay really strong as well. We have a really old housing stock. The stock is small. Even if you account for all of the improvements that have occurred over time, um, we still have, our current stock is still more than 20% smaller than a new home. So if you bought an average home, a median home, if you bought a median home, it's 20% smaller than a new home. So what are you going to do? Well, if you build up enough equity, then you're going to improve that home. You're going to add on to it. You're going to make it more similar to a new home. And oh, how do you build up equity? Well, you have home prices shoot up by 20% per year. So we have record levels of equity right now. So there's a lot of equity out there. And so people are going to fix, and they, and they can't buy new homes because there's none available. So they're going to continue to fix up rather than move up. So that should all lead to pretty strong demand um, over the next two years. So again, not a continued growth, but not a major decline in, uh, in demand. So that was my opinion. This is looking at the data. But you guys are actually out there in the market. So Steve, I'm going to go last first, right? So um, I'll go right back to you. So um, what, are you, what are you seeing in the market? Are you seeing continued strong demand this year? We've seen, uh, we've seen good demand so far this year. It's been uh, a little more modest over uh, the last month or so. But up until that point, we'd seen really strong demand patterns uh, this year. I think the housing demographics speak for themselves. I think we are set for about a decade of strong overall growth and demand in the housing industry. Interest rates are certainly a concern short term. Um, but let's remember that historically an interest rate in the five or six percent range was considered a pretty good bargain for, you know, most people that are older than 30. Yeah. Um, that would have been a pretty good target for your interest rate, if not uh, a smoking deal at some point. Um, we talked just before we got on the panel today that some of us remember, you know, 16, 17, 18 percent interest rates. Uh, and obviously, we don't want to go back there. That wasn't a good experience either. But five or six percent, if we can just get there in a hurry, take the pain that comes short term while we all reset and readjust our expectations, I think is a very sustainable type of 
long-term arrangement and the underlying dynamics call for a lot of wood uh, to be consumed over the next decade. Yeah. The other interesting point, and, and Hugh touched on a little bit about the green aspect of, of our industry, I think wood has been underrepresented as the best building product to use. Um, the development of the mass timber markets and CLT, I think, is going to start to have a good impact on telling that environmental story better. They're doing a good job of telling a story that our industry historically has not done a very good job of. And as that demand starts to build a little bit, and, and that will also help take away any excess production and supply issues that come to the market from time to time and continue to keep markets elevated, I think. Yeah, there's no doubt you're right about that. And, and if you look at, it's, it's not just the traditional people. In fact, if you look at who's investing in this, the CLT building space or the people who are investing in, um, in so offsite construction, which is, is heavily use, used in, and they're using CLT in that um, because you can't, like, you know, a contractor can't go up and nail up a, we, we actually <laughs> stored like four CLT panels at our office and they weigh about 56 pounds. So it's just, you, you definitely can't put them up. But you look at the people who are investing in it, it's, it's Amazon, it's Google, it's, um, it's Walmart. These are major corporations, major tech, uh, major tech and, um, and uh, retail corporations that are investing in this space. So it's not the traditional people. So I think you're absolutely right about that. that this, is, this is really coming out. Um, so just a, a, a point, um, again, is that if, if we go back to 80, 17, 18% interest rates, which it's not gonna, it's highly, highly unlikely to happen, but even if we did, um, some people would say, oh, well, then we're going to have a recession similar to the Great Recession where we had housing starts drop to, um, drop to 500 or 600,000. We would definitely not expect that. The reason housing starts drop to five to 600,000 is because of this, this, the lack of adults that were there. It was, it was a number of different factors, but that was, it, it, you have a recession, a sharp recession, housing starts are going to drop to a million units. You have a sharp recession that coincides with just simply a lack of adults in those home buying years, and then you drop to, uh, to half a million. So even if we did see that, we wouldn't expect. We, we're looking, I mean, we're not calling for a recession. If we have a really, really terrible recession, you're going to get down to the historical recessions, which are 1.2 million starts. So we, we need to, we, we can't reset our expectations for end use market activity based on what happened in the Great Recession because that was, just, that was an anomaly. Um, I don't, do you guys want to add anything to, so Bart, or do you want to add anything to what you're seeing in current demand? Well, for me, it's, um, there's so much noise in the signal, uh, quite frankly. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the completion's at 1.3, so we can talk about housing starts being 1.8 for as long as you want, but the fact is, is the demand that we're seeing is tied to 1.3. Um, so when are we going to see the, the true demand um, uh, uh, for, for new home construction? So that's, that's one. And, and the other one is on the repair and remodel side, um, I think we're, we're seeing that, that there's the, the appetite you know, kind of goes away when the prices get too high. Yeah. Um, and uh, so is that deferred demand? Is it, is it gone to other products? I mean, there's all of those things to consider. But I... I think that we're not actually seeing the true demand in the marketplace today. Um, and then you can't talk about demand without talking about, um, you know, all the supply constraints that we've already covered off. But at the end of the day, there are su sign significant supply uh, constraints in the market that are artificially um, affecting the market. And so, you know, it'd be like once all those things clear, I think short term, we'll see what, what's actually really there. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you look at it, uh, there's lots of tailwinds. We've gone over all of them. Um, the spoiler in all of this is interest rates. Um, it's affordability. It's what we saw in, in the back half of 2018 and, yeah. and stuck with us through 2019. Um, I don't think we're into the same situation there, but the end of the day, the, the economy's a bit too hot and it's, gotta, it's just gotta be cooled down and hopefully it gets done in a way that yeah. doesn't uh, throw the pendulum the other direction. Yeah, those are good points, and and the fact that you mentioned affordability instead of just interest rates is actually key because it's not interest rates alone that affect um, that affect demand for housing. It's it is actually affordability, which is a combination of income growth, interest rates, and home prices. And as you see the interest rates go up, home prices will stop 
appreciating. So um, we'll see that start to, to actually be a net positive. And then the other piece is um, the, the, good, the benefit of the really strong economy, which is causing interest rates to go up, is that incomes are going up rapidly. So that's gonna somewhat offset the, um, the rise in interest rates. So actually we track this and we're still, um, affordability is still above historical averages. So we're even though interest rates have moved up um, fairly substantially, we're still in pretty good shape from, a, uh, from an interest rate perspective. Um, so I'm gonna shift a little bit because I think I, I'm probably gonna run out of time, but, um, and I do wanna open it up to questions from you guys too. Um, so Oog, um, do you, so one of the things I, I talked about, um, new construction versus residential improvements, are, are you, and historically everyone has really looked at new home construction as the driver of lumber demand. Um, are you seeing that continue, or are you seeing more of a, put, of, of a shift towards R&R activity, residential improvements being a, a main driver? I think we'll see both. I mean, if there's anything that uh, the consolidation of the retailers have done well, I mean, it's a really powerful machine. You look at the Lowe's, Home Depot's, uh, Menards, uh, you go at the cash register, they know who you are, they have your zip code. They know what you like. They target, uh, you know, they target you on uh, on your emails, uh, so they drive consumption, uh, and it's also a big driver of the economy. We talk a lot about housing starts, but they're just as much wood consumed in uh, R and R than housing starts, mm -hmm. plus or minus a few percent. Uh, you've shown that the housing stock in the U.S. is getting old, uh, so that will drive more on R and R. The other thing that, uh, and I wouldn't have never said that pre-COVID because, you know, we talk about the age group and uh, I was wondering if that age group really wanted to live in a house or, or a condo downtown and, and having the big city activity. But I think uh, COVID kind of changed that and it has yet to be seen if that's permanent or not. Mm. Uh, but if it is permanent, it's, it's going to drive a lot of R&R uh, &R, uh, outside of the major cities. Uh, we have countries now, they have, and I forgot the term, like uh, itinerant workers where you can work overseas and you don't pay taxes for so many days. Uh, it's true uh, if you get out of Vancouver, get out of Montreal, get out of Toronto, you, you can live in a house that's cheaper. You can do a lot of improvement and have a good quality of life. We as a company, we have the hybrid system where people show up uh, between two to three days a week. There's a lot of companies that, that do that. Uh, so Bart talked about noise. I would totally agree with him. I think the noise there to stay though. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if we'll get it clear anytime soon. Uh, and and, and what, when people don't want to travel, when people are unsure, they want to stay home. So that will drive R&R. &R. But the pent up demand is so high in the US that uh, it's gonna have to remain higher than average uh, for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And just as evidence, um, data evidence to what you're saying in terms of um, people don't have to live near their jobs anymore, we're seeing, so that normally in a typical upturn, you'll see a disparity in regions in terms of home price increases. It's across the board. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing just as much demand in Nebraska as we are in San Francisco. In fact, we're probably seeing more there. So because people have realized that they can go live and they can buy a home in Nebraska for you know a half a million dollars, that's um, much, much nicer than the $2 million that they're gonna spend in San Francisco to get a shack, which has moss growing on the, the roof. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things, I'm just gonna, one more comment. Oh, wrong one. Um, one more comment. Um, is that you said you didn't know, it, you, you don't know if um, the shift is permanent or not in terms of people wanting to live in the cities. So one of the things that we talked about back in 2008, when a lot of people at the time were saying that we were gonna see the single family share of housing drop to uh, 50%, everyone was gonna shift in that direction because th that's what we were seeing because people were, were they, they weren't able to, to well, they couldn't afford the uh, single family homes and they were all getting foreclosed on. And the thing that we identified at the time was we said that's not the case. What, we're, what you're seeing is that, um, so this, this, what we were saying was that this big bulge of population 10 years ago, they were in their early 20s. So when you're in your early 20s, you don't wanna be my neighbor, right? You don't wanna live in the suburbs in the single family house next to me. You wanna live in the city and have, you know, be able to go out at night. So we saw a shift in demand that was related to the population. Well, going forward, you know, at least for the next 10 years, we have, or five years, these guys are gonna be demanding those single family homes. Um, 
so I know I have to move on, but Steve, I do want to ask just one more question, um, and and that is it's as it relates to industrial, because we we have data on the um, on the new home construction side, but I'm just curious if you're seeing on the industrial side with the high lumber prices, are you starting to see substitution for other for other products, plastics, um, in say in packaging? Um, um, the short answer is no, uh, and, and for some of the reasons that you alluded to earlier related to lumber price, and that's that steel and plastic and other alternatives have also seen volatility that's somewhat similar um, in scope to wood. What it has done is brought, drawn a little more attention to the spend uh, at some manufacturing facilities, and because of that, they're looking at ways how do we optimize our packaging so that we use a little bit less wood to accomplish the same goal or how do we introduce a blend of cardboard into our packaging or plastic wrap or something as an alternative that doesn't require us to use as much wood to try and get the expense down. So they're certainly identifying opportunities for cost savings initiatives that will potentially reduce some of the consumption. Uh, but it's not because there's a, a pure alternative. It's more that there's been attention drawn to the expense that's being right. incurred on a regular right. basis. <clears throat> so, so people are using the product more efficiently more than they are substituting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And maybe uh, one, uh, yeah. when that efficiency happens, the consumption's gone forever, mm. right? Because these efficiencies, they're there for a long time and yeah. they're there to stay. And, and that's what extreme prices do, right? Yeah. They remove the inefficient usage of, uh, of yeah. products. That makes sense. The positive offset. The positive offset is the potential for some of this onshoring to actually take place, and for the overall macro industrial market to grow a little bit again yeah. in North America. Um, but I agree with who once once you figure out how to use a one by three instead of a one by four, uh, twenty five percent of what you need is gone forever. So. Yeah. And the truth is, that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world because of new markets for wood. So if you think about the fact that we are going to need, um, you know, over the next course of the next decade, at least a billion, if not billions of board feet of lumber for CLT production as people go to, to you know, as people are building taller and taller buildings out of wood, because, again, um, you're sequestering carbon when you're building these buildings out of wood as opposed to emitting carbon. Um, it's part of the solution. So we're going to see that we're, we're going to need that wood to make CLT. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about CLT is, you know, you can pretty much put anything into it. So, okay, just, you're going to... one see. really quick yeah. point on that. Um, <laughs> I, I'd be remiss. Maybe, not, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> well, no, I just, I, I, no, I'm going to support what you just said. Um, you know, the work that the Softwood Lumber Board does, uh, it's pretty key. Um, yeah. The U.S. Woodworks. Um, they're converting projects. So, uh, you know, I actually see it the other way around. We're actually going after uh, those products and replacing them with, with that, you know, a good story, uh, solid wood. Um, think wood is the communication side of that piece, and, and they're out trying to tell the story, and I, I, I agree. I don't think our industry does a very good job of, of uh, uh, you know, of telling the story uh, from an environmental and sustainability standpoint. Um, so there's work to be done there, but there is still a lot of work with the Softwood Lumber Board and, of course, those, those other organizations that they're supporting. And if you have some time, I really recommend going on their website, um, going on U.S. Woodworks' website. You'll see the level of activity that's taking place in the conversions that are, that, that are going on. It's, it's actually... It's tremendous. It is. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And and I obviously we've all been in this industry for a long time and, and the change that's occurred since um you know since SLB was established in terms of the messaging that's going out, it's really fantastic. And and it's just for the future generations we need to make sure that we're building more out of wood. Not you know, has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, we all do better as in personally, but also it's just, it's much better for the environment. We have all sorts of data on that. If anybody ever wants to know about it, obviously you can go um, to SLB and Thinkwood um, and Woodworks, but we also have a tremendous amount of data on uh, building, uh, building tall buildings out of wood and the benefits of that. And we're, it's, it's something that is coming and we're gonna see that. And we're seeing, just from our perspective, we have clients that are not even nearly adjacent to our space who are interested in this because they see this as a future as well. And I'm, I'm talking just all sorts of different types of manufacturers. And that's fantastic because that's such a total change. Yeah. It's a 180 from the narrative yeah. that was in the, the media and the marketplace in general just 
20 years ago. And the, ki the kids who are, you know, the, the early 20-somethings today, they're, they're demanding this. And, and so it's, we're, we're getting this message out to them slowly, but it's getting across. And I think that, uh, I think that it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be important. Right, do you guys want anything else, or should I move on? So the next portion is the uh, geopolitical situation. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, a lot of things changed in February. Um, and what is, and, and so what does this mean? This so just for the world and for, for on, a, on, a, um, on a personal and on a, on a human level, uh, obviously it's, it's terrible. What I'd like to talk about today is sort of bring this back to what does that mean potentially for our industry? Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to talk a little bit about like what, like how, is, how important is Russia? Like is Russia that important in the, in the markets? Um, if we look at their overall economy, the answer to that's no. They're a tiny overall economy. They're, they're smaller than you know, the state of Texas. They're smaller than California. I mean, it's, it's, their, their economy is very small. Um, they are an important natural resource producer. So they're very important in oil. They're very important in timber. Um, so, and at the same thing, this I'm just talking about overall economic activity. If we look at specific to our industry, how important are they for consumption? Well, again, they're not important at all. They're, you know, two and a half percent of global consumption comes from Russia. Very small, um, very small component of global consumption. Your main consuming regions are obviously North America with the U.S. and Canada, Europe and China. Um, but if we move to production, they are actually quite a bit more important. You still have those same main consuming regions or also main producing regions, but then you add into there um, Russia and the Southern Hemisphere, with Russia being um, almost 12% of global production of softwood lumber. So, the, and I won't get into the, the hardwood plywood. They're obviously extremely important for hardwood plywood, um, but this is lumber, so we'll, we'll focus on that. And, um, and they are important for, they are an important producer of lumber. So. Where do they, they consume, well obviously if you, if you look at this, they're, you know, they're 3%, 2.5% of global consumption and they're 11%, 12% of production, so obviously they're a big exporter. Um, so where do they export? If we focus on the right hand chart first here, you can see where, chi where um, Russia mostly export their wood. And their main export market is China. Um, and then to a lesser extent, it is, um, we have the CIS, so that's the Commonwealth of Independent States. Those are all the southern um, states uh, the, the, on the southern border of Russia, um, which are still heavily linked to the Russian economy. Um, you also have the European Union is a big export destination, and they're in blue. And then you have the Middle East and North Africa, which that's the yellow. And, and historically, that was a pretty important region, but they actually became less important as Russia's tried to focus a little more on selling into, um, into China. So if we're thinking about where are the potential markets for Russian wood going forward? These are those markets. Well, let's examine a couple of these markets, the Western ones in particular, and um, in Japan and Korea. So not so much Korea um, or Japan yet, but it's coming. And definitely for the European Union, obviously they have sanctions on Russia, so they're not gonna allow any Russian imports. Um, and just as importantly, even if they did, Russia has banned the export of wood to Europe, um, at least till the end of this year. So. Where would we expect to see Russia shipping its wood if they're not the wood that was um, historically going to the European Union or to Japan and North Korea? We're going to see that shift to other markets. The two main markets where that's likely to go is to China, um, obviously a big, big, the major consumer, and then um, to a lesser extent, the Middle East and North Africa, because um, those are two markets that they could go to. So what does this mean for Europe? It, when this initially happened, when this war initially started, we would get the question, well, what does it mean if Europe doesn't get that Russian wood? And we said, well, you don't want to just look at Russia, you want to look at Belarus because they're sanctioned too, and you need to look at Ukraine because Ukraine's obviously not producing any lumber. So when we put those three um, countries together, then you get about eight million cubic meters of wood that was being supplied by those three countries. And to put this into perspective, um, Europe consumes about 85 million cubic meters of lumber. So that's almost 10% of their supply of lumber was coming from...